Okay, well, good evening, everyone, and welcome back to our second Here For You uh, presentation as part of our 15th Here For You public engagement session as we move through recovery together as a community. I'm Adam Hardiman. I'm with the Wood Buffalo Recovery Task Force. So happy uh, you could join us this evening. Of course, down the street at St. Crude Sport and Wellness Centre, we have another engagement session taking place uh, focused on our Draper residents. So I know they're not probably watching online, but to anyone who's out there, that's happening as well tonight. And of course, everyone joining us on Facebook Live for a second presentation. So just some logistical pieces. We will talk tonight uh, about our recovery campaign plan, our five pillars, as we provide a general recovery update to the community. So anyone here in the audience or uh, watching at home, if, just to facilitate the, the viewers at home, if you do have a question, if you wouldn't mind going to the microphone to ask that question, you can do that. You're not, you don't have to, but that will be greatly appreciated. And then we'll move to the Facebook Live questions that come in. Of course, our five uh, campaign pillars, you may know, uh, people, environment, economy, rebuild, and mitigate. And we'll hear from some of our members of the task force who will speak to some of the activities happening in those areas. Of course, those people will be Nadia Power, who will speak to people, Aaron O'Neill, environment, Kelly Hansen, economy, Greg Wolf, rebuild, and Aaron O'Neill once again on mitigate. We're also joined by many of our partners here tonight from the Wood Buffalo Recovery Committee, we have our Chair Jeanette Bankhars, as well as Marty Giles, and Councillor Sheldon Germain. And our community partners that are with us, we have uh, the Insurance Bureau of Canada, uh, the YMCA of Northern Alberta, Red Cross, Government of Alberta, of course members of our task force and municipal staff, including representatives from the Economic Development and Planning and Development Department, as well as the Fort McMurray Fire Department. So without further ado, to begin our presentation, I'll invite Nadia Power, who will be presenting on the People Pillar. Thank you, Adam. I'm very happy to be here. Thank you for joining us here and for those watching online. As Adam said, my name is Nadia Power. Very happy to talk to you tonight about the People Pillar. The primary objective of the People Pillar is to enhance the well-being of all residents, recognizing that our people are our most valuable resource. Our activities will focus on inclusion and acceptance through a diversity plan. We'll work with groups that provide services towards psychosocial recovery. Those groups include AHS, the CMHA, some other solutions, Boreal Counseling Services, Legacy Counseling Services, Waypoints, there are so many, and RMWB's own Family and Community Support Services and others. We want to encourage and enable participation in sports, recreational activities, as well as participation in the arts, cultural, and spiritual activities by expanding community development opportunities. We want to engage in meaningful engagement needs-based analysis just to make sure that our residents are well informed and that we're owning our own recovery. One of the primary concerns that we have right now is around housing and I want to tell you that you do have some options. You can go online at any time and get more information about this, but just to mention that Wood Buffalo Housing and Development Corporation, they have their social housing program as well as the affordable housing program. I encourage you, if you still are looking for housing, to go and speak to them. You can meet them at the address listed here on the screen, 203-10020 Franklin Avenue, or you can email directly to Hillary at wbhdc.ca or by calling them at 780-743-4140. You can also go online to our website where we keep an up-to-date list of property managers and those different options that you have for rentals across the region. And as well, you should know that we have hotels offering long-term long stay rates in the region as well. If you're looking for some support, I would direct you towards the Red Cross. The Red Cross is helping support our residents with rent and mortgage payments, security deposits, furniture, storage and repairs, and many other things. They're available to do individual case-by-case -case assessments with you to talk about your own particular needs and how we can support. The best way to reach them is by calling 1-855-553-5505. And you should know as well that they have two locations. Of course, their Hardin Street location there's walk-in appointments available there, and they also have another location at Franklin Avenue next to the A&W, and in there there's re-entry and also scheduled appointments taken in that location. 
If you haven't already heard about the group Insure, you should know that this is the NGO supporting uninsured and underinsured through recovery. And they're doing this by supporting with repairs and actual rebuilding support for residents. You can reach them at nsuurwoodbuffalo at gmail.com. And of course, always, we direct people, if any general inquiries that you have or if you're looking for support, we would direct you to the Pulse Line, 780-743-7000. That's just a little bit of an overview of people. I'm going to hand it over now to Erin. Thank you, Nadia, and as was mentioned, my name is Erin O'Neill, and I'm the Operations Manager with the Recovery Task Force, and I have the pleasure tonight to speak to the Environment and the Mitigate Pillar. So first, the Environment Pillar. Um, our main objective of the Environment Pillar is to con continue to identify, assess, and measure the effects of the wildfire on our environment. As many know, we have done phase one ash and air sampling and phase two soil testing. And the samples were representative of the broader community and taken from various areas throughout the community to make sure that we had that representative sample. Uh, soil tests were evaluated against the Alberta Tier 1 Soil and Groundwater Remediation Guidelines, and this is the most stringent standard based on land use and exposure pathways to make sure that we, were, we knew that the areas were safe for our residents. Um, specifically for soil, um, two samples were taken, uh, the top layer of soil between 0 and 5 centimeters and a second sample between 5 and 20 centimeters was also taken. However, if the top layer showed no unsafe levels, then the deeper soil level did not need to be tested. So we are confident in the health of our environment based on that, on the air, ash and soil sampling and residents can be insured by assured by the science and the results of the phase one and two testing. Um, no results we seen were surprising or unexpected and there was no, ma there was no results that exceeded our standards. Uh, the municipality has recommended in the demolition permit that the top two inches or five centimeters of soil do be removed and the municipality has in fact done this in all the sites that we are cleaning up um, for our remediation and those that we have taken over as part of the demolition process that were not complete by October 1st. Um, we are in the process of organizing the phase three testing following the removal of all the ash and debris and that um, we will announce the um, timeline for the phase three testing shortly and it will be within public spaces um, throughout the municipality. Um, one thing we did want to stress tonight, um, that residents can conduct their own soil testing. We have had some residents um, conduct their soil testing. Um, however, they, were, they did have some concerns with the results, but that was because they were not measuring uh, against the same guideline that we were measuring. So we just did want to give some advice to residents who are doing their own testing tonight, that you make sure that you seek a reputable expert when doing this testing, and ensure that your samples are evaluated against that same Alberta Tier 1 soil and groundwater remediation guideline for residential and parkland. And you can, um, many insurance companies do cover the cost of this testing, so make sure that you have that conversation with your insurance company about having that testing done to, s to make sure that your costs are covered um, for that. And with that, I would like to pass it over to Kelly Hansen for the Economy Pillar. Thank you. Thanks, Erin. I appreciate the opportunity to provide an update on our economy pillar. First, I'm going to take the opportunity to speak to what is our primary objectives within the economy pillar. The first one being enabling businesses within our region as they return and recover from the consequences of the wildfire. Second is supporting oil and gas production within the region by minimizing impacts on the local workforce. Third would be maximizing local economic benefit of recovery opportunities and reaffirming and enhancing our ability to provide regional services and programs. And the fifth is seize diversification opportunities as part of recovery. As we work through this recovery pillar, we'll continue to partner with and engage various stakeholders and business owners within our region. In this portion, what I'm gonna to speak to is what have we heard what's been done, and what can we expect in the future? In partnership with Economic Development, 
and number of projects, initiatives, and engagements have taken place throughout our region. We've heard from businesses in a number of ways, one of which was through a hotline that was established in May. Over 16,000 calls were received. A business survey was launched where we had the opportunity to hear from 4,000 businesses outlining their needs as they, as they came in. This was an ongoing opportunity. Economic development hit the streets. We went business to business, talked to owners, operators, and heard where they were having struggles. It was also an opportunity to thank them for the hard work it took to return to the region, open their doors again, and provide services to our residents. What's been done? Economic development and the recovery team were able to work together, open a back to business resource center, which we're proud to say is still operating at this time, five days a week, providing resources within the region. An exciting note for that is that we'll be taking that back to business resource center into our rural communities a schedule can be found online. I'll give you that resource at the end of the presentation. More than 30 learning events have been held at the Back to Business Resource Center in partnership with our stakeholders, offering free business coaching. That's a program that's ongoing. Working, um, we also have at this time, small business financial support on site at the Back to Business Resource Center. The resources available I would direct you to Small Business Financial Support is at www.ymmsmallbizrecovery.ca or through the phone number of 1-855-769-2249 or you can go to the Back to Business Resource Center which is located at 9816 Hardin Street or choosewoodbuffalo.ca. We encourage you to visit us, talk to us, engage with us. We'll also be a part of the Here For You next Thursday, speaking specifically to uh, small business and business within our region. Next, I will pass it off to Greg Wolf with Safety Codes and the Rebuild Pillar. Thanks, Kelly. As Kelly said, my name is Greg Wolf. I'm with the Safety Codes branch of Planning and Development. As we move into rebuild and you drive around the municipality, you'll probably notice that most of the uh, foundations have been removed. And uh, right now we're seeing a lot of uh, empty holes and excavations still. So if you are at that stage of uh, the demolition and you've uh, got a site where there are still hazards on the site, which would include um, excavations where they did not completely fill the site, you're gonna be responsible to fence that site uh, because it is a, a, a nuisance and attractant and uh, there's possibility of accumulation of water and other uh, that would be potentially a hazard for people in the area. Um, as you can see from the slide, uh, fencing is to be a strongly constructed uh, six foot construction fence. The fencing that you see out there right now is pretty typical of the fencing that we would expect to see around properties. The thing to keep in mind is that you're gonna be responsible for maintaining that and keeping that until all of the hazards have been removed from your site, which includes uh, filling the uh, any excavations or or even even depressions as deep as uh, or as shallow even as two feet, so um, something to be aware of. If you haven't backfilled, uh, we would recommend that you do backfill. If you look at the next slide, um, so it electing not to backfill uh, definitely does have some. Uh, risks that come with that. Besides uh, having to maintain fencing around that site, uh, if you're planning on rebuilding on that, uh, on that, uh, in that excavation, um, there's uh, um, a strong possibility uh, that you're for sure going to freeze the bottom of that hole. The frost typically in this country goes down a couple meters. And so if the bottom of your excavation is where the foundation of your home is going to be when you decide to rebuild, um, if the ground freezes under that, that soil will likely no longer, no, no longer be suitable or capable of supporting a house. So the risk you take by not backfilling is that uh, there could be some very expensive remediation costs uh, which would have to be done under the supervision of a geotechnical engineer come the spring. The other hazard with that, of course, is that uh, when the ground freezes down that hard, it takes a long time to thaw out. So if you're thinking about building anytime soon, um, again, we would really strongly encourage you for all of these reasons to, to fill that hole. Um, if the hole is not filled and protected from frost and you get a couple meters of frost uh, in the bottom of that excavation, you could be waiting till uh, easily June or July before all the frost comes out of that ground. And even at that point, you'd, 
you'd still be having to remove it. And having a geotechnical engineer um, uh, visiting the site and confirming that number one, all the frost has been removed, and that uh, even the soils uh, at the at the bottom of that are are still even capable of supporting a foundation. So there's some significant risks and costs uh, that can be incurred by not backfilling. Uh, so we would uh, definitely in uh, encourage everyone who is. Um, who is uh, in the process of, of doing demolition and has open excavations right now uh, to re call up and, and uh, consult with maybe one of the geotechnical consultant firms that are in the municipality uh, and, uh, and get their input and then make a, a good, wise decision on what you're going to be doing with your, uh, with your rebuild and your foundation. Our next slide there on winter building. If you are building this winter, there's some things that you need to be aware of as well. Obviously, when you're, um, the, the cold temperature can affect uh, the materials that you use. Uh, particularly right now, we're starting to see people pouring concrete foundations. Um, you can see on the slide that basically these, this is the building code uh, straight up requirement. When the air temperature drops below plus five degrees Celsius, it's the responsibility of contractors to keep that concrete at a temperature of not less than plus 10 degrees Celsius. So in order to do that, um, that typically requires covering it in and using heating equipment in order to maintain that temperature. It's very critical that uh, you uh, maintain that temperature because as the temperature starts to drop on the concrete, the concrete stops hydrating. And, um, and uh, if it freezes, uh, it, it will not um, actually gain all the strength that it needs in order to meet the minimum code requirements and could potentially give you problems down the road. So it's important to discuss this with your contractor and make sure that they have the uh, appropriate measures in place in order to keep that concrete where it needs to be. Another consideration is, of course, if you're building uh, through the winter, you cannot allow the, uh, the ground under your completed foundation to freeze either. Um, it's uh, very easy to get differential movement between different parts of the structure as there some parts are buried and some parts are not. And again, uh, if one part uh, heaves significantly and the other part doesn't, it's uh, entirely likely that that foundation will break. So again, important to talk to your contractor and make sure that they understand this. Um, and uh, just to conclude, if anybody has any questions on any of the points that I brought up, be sure to call the Safety Codes branch. Uh, we'll be happy to explain and discuss any of these points with you. Now I'll just turn it back over to Aaron. Thank you. Thank you, Greg. So um, our last pillar I'd like to talk about tonight is our mitigate pillar. So the in each of our, on our campaign plan, in each of the pillars, we have identified our main objectives. So the main objective of the mitigate pillar is to mit implement mitigation measures with a view of improving resiliency. So the main thing about the mitigation pillar is leaving a legacy or a long-lasting impact to um, from rebuilding from this fire to leave something in place for the residents to protect our safety in the future. So that resiliency can be achieved by implementing mitigation measures that reduce the probability of a devastating event and or provide increased overall safety for the residents should an event occur. There are a number of way of layers within mitigation. So first, physical controls such as fire smarting or specific engineering controls that can be in place. Um, then we add the layers of protection, including administrative plan plans, such as emergency response plans. And then we also want to ensure a safe and secure mechanism for moving the population away from the risk. Um, I did want to highlight some of the projects that are currently underway. Some of these projects that are listed here um, do play into the rebuild pillar as well. However, they do help to um, ensure the mitigation measures are in place. So the hazardous tree removal is currently underway, and that is removing any dead or fallen trees from the area to make sure that we are safe. Um, Regrading of fire break areas in those areas that were um, Dozer, for dozer guard used, um, there, are some, there have some, some grading issues, so we are underway of fixing those grading and draining, drainage issues, and all of that should be completed in mid-December. 
Uh, a post wildfire ha hazard assessment was completed um, by a forestry and fire expert and fire smart expert uh, immediately following the fire. From that, we were able to recommend a number of mitigation measures that be can be put in place. Phase one of fire smarting has already been complete, and that was the elimination of some vegetation and the clearing of some vegetation throughout um, the area to make sure um, that we did reduce that hazard. Uh, fire smart phase 2b is starting shortly and that's within the birchwood trails there will be a specific session on that next thursday night at the here for you session so if you want to join us four to eight next thursday night for uh, details on what will be happening in the birchwood trails we do encourage you to join us for that the contractor will in fact be on site he's had experience he was involved in slave lake and he will be here to answer any residents questions uh, about protecting that air area for the resiliency for the future and with that, that's the presentation of our five pillars, and I'd like to pass it back over to Adam. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Erin. I feel like we're on the town halls. Just thanking you for another great presentation, great answer for a resident. So uh, what wraps up our five pillars. So we'll uh, first, I guess, go to the question to the audience. First, I'll ask Jordan, do we have anything coming in on Facebook Live? So it looks like we have nothing as of yet. So anyone in the audience with, uh, with a question for any of our presenters on our five pillars of recovery in our campaign plan. I know that our, uh, our board chair, uh, Jeanette Bankars, was mentioning she had some questions that came in from uh, residents so that were related to this. So Jeanette, if you wanted to relay those, whichever one you'd like. Sure, thanks, Adam. So I was just listening to the presentation. I think there might be a couple questions or clarifications that our residents might like to hear as well. Um, so just regarding the people pillar, um, around the Wood Buffalo Housing and Development uh, Corporation. I, I think some people may have thought, okay, I've applied before, I didn't, I wasn't accepted because I made too much money or whatever, I didn't fit the gap housing or the social housing. With regards to those that are most affected um, from the wildfire, the Wood Buffalo Housing and Development Corporation has relaxed their restrictions. So you are able, uh, you, you do not have those income restrictions or those thresholds that you need to fall under to apply. You can also bring your pets. They have a, a number of units. They've also converted um, several or, or a number, I think it's 20 or something like that, uh, of smaller units to be three and four bedroom units to help support our community um, that are our residents that are most affected. And I believe as well some of our private um, rental agencies and hotel groups also have availability if uh, you're still out and, and not back in Wood Buffalo, we'd love to have you back. So uh, please uh, look to that. I think that's on our website as well on how to contact all of those. The other thing, Greg, maybe you can answer some of my questions. So I'll ask you to come back to the mic because I don't have these answers. I'm, I'm in banking. I'm not in uh, safety codes. So yeah, okay. around site, f uh, the f fencing, um, my, when you said you had to maintain the fencing, my understanding is it, it's at minimum a daily inspection. And so if a fence has fallen down because there was wind or someone pushed snow over it and it fell down, what are the requirements uh, to rectify that by our residents? Yeah, so the, you're right. The, the code really only has two options. One is that that fence is maintained in place round the clock or someone is physically on the site, main, like visually supervising the site to ensure that no person uh, could uh, fall or, or be injured by a hazard on the site. So yeah, we would expect that, the, the, that someone is going and checking that site, like you said, at least on a daily basis. And I have noticed that the, the fences can fail for any number of reasons as well. The weather can change. One minute, you know, the fence is plopped down on some solid ice or, or something else or frozen mud. It warms up, the ground softens, and the, and the fence moves. Um, some of the fences are uh, currently in between lots or too close to the excavation, and we were seeing some of the excavations sloughing in, and that's also causing some of the fences to fall over. So, yes, re if residents are electing to uh, use fencing, they're going to need to at least go there on a daily basis and make sure that the fencing is, has not been even even uh, stolen or, or just been uh, unwired and opened up by people. So what would happen if we came across one of these fences that was down? Would we notify the homeowner? Would we be checking on it? Would there be fines? Those kind of things? What, what happens with that? It depends. Um, if We would 
we would uh, contact the owner. So ultimately, maintaining that um, in a safe uh, manner is going to be the responsibility of the owner. So that would be our that would be our approach. We've got DCOs, development compliance officers, um, bylaw people, uh, that are uh, constantly uh, patrolling all of the areas, and uh, and so they can they're they're they can see that as well, as well as the security people uh, are contacting um, Mark K with with fencing in the REOC as well. So uh, it is being monitored. Okay. You also mentioned about the backfill. I'm. I'm not in construction, so I don't understand uh, what the increase, like to me what you've said about backfilling obviously is it's the best choice, yeah. but when I'm looking from a financial perspective, because sometimes you know people may be underinsured, um, so from a financial perspective, what would be the cost to backfill the average um, hole left from the concrete being removed versus a remediation of having fencing after the fact or when I'm ready to rebuild? Well, I mean, fencing right now goes, the, the calls I've made, I've seen it anywhere from 35 to 65 and 90 cents or higher a foot per month is the way that works out. So it depends on if you go get the fencing and set it up yourself. Some companies will charge a, a fee to, to set it up, but again, they're not going to maintain it. So you're looking at a continual uh, rental cost. Um, the biggest risk, of course, is that if you're actually planning on rebuilding on that site, is dealing with the soil conditions later if you haven't backfilled. That, that can be, that's a, it's a complete unknown, but, f but from what I've heard from s even some of the conditions now, uh, because we're getting a geotechnical, and geotechnical inspection and foundation is required um, at the footing stage before any foundation is placed in the municipality right now. So, um, so that's not something that you can get around. Um, some of what they're finding is just because the excavation and, and even because the, some of the foundations sat open through the summer and just absorbed water, um, even those have got some significant softening of soils and there's, in the work, uh, there's been some significant cost to remove those materials. If you compound that and add to it by freezing those soils all the way down and then letting all the snow and melt uh, accumulate through the next year, you, you potentially even worsening the situation. The cost to deal with that if you have to um, go substantially deeper with your foundations are, are very high. So I couldn't even begin to venture a cost because it's so variable, um, but it is expensive. Now on the flip side, I was up in Avisan today and I spoke with one of the trucking companies that does, um, uh, that is doing backfilling and um, right what I was told, and, and I believe it to be true, is right now there is free fill uh, coming from uh, Abrams uh, land. And so the cost is essentially the cost to put it in a truck, drive it down and put it in your yard and, and uh, run a machine over it, grade the site. One of the other issues with leaving the hole open as well that I, I didn't mention was um, as these, um, as these uh, depressions and excavations accumulate water, that water has to go somewhere. You cannot, uh, you cannot take that water and just pump it to the street. That's considered toxic, okay, because it's contaminated with whatever was in that hole. Our storm system goes to the river, like every storm system in every city, because it's just going to be rain water. So if you're letting that foundation accumulate water, you're also going to have the added cost of, uh, of usually hydrovacking that out and disposing it somewhere, and the wastewater treatment plant does not take that water. So that's another added risk to leaving the foundation open. So in, in my mind, there are no upsides to not filling in that hole. And worst case scenario, we certainly don't want any of our children playing near or able to get into uh, a hole that has some water in it for sure. So that's another Absolutely. concern, the safety part of it. Yep. Um, last question for you around um, the consequences of not following the Alberta Building Code around concrete foundations and keeping it warm enough to cure. Well, I didn't go too far into that, but I will say in the last couple days, we failed six foundations. Um, at the footing stage because the concrete wasn't kept at temperature. So if that happens, basically what happens, the job goes on, uh, gets stopped, and uh, we require the, uh, the owner and the contractor to hire uh, an independent firm to provide third-party testing on the concrete. 
So basically, they come out and core the concrete, and uh, then they uh, and then they basically produce a cylinder from that, and then compress the cylinder, break it, and and we get confirmation. What happens is uh, we go out on site ourselves in those cases. We meet with the company that's doing the coring so that the inspector himself can actually choose where the cores are coming from. And um, some of the cores we saw today that I physically saw uh, were pretty bad. So, um, you know, worst case scenario, um, I know for a fact some of those footings are just going to have to come out. So. Um, Definitely, uh, definitely a concern, and that uh, and something that we are taking seriously. I know a lot of contractors have, kind of, depending on where they're coming from or what they're used to, they're like, oh well, we can just go ahead and do that, and it'll be fine. And um, you know, in our mind, it'll be fine. Or the contractor said so, um, is not going to be an acceptable uh, answer that I can give to the public as far as what's going on with these foundations. So all our inspectors are, uh, again, when they're doing inspections, which is daily, they're patrolling the neighborhoods and noting when concrete is being poured and what sort of process is going on around protecting that concrete. And uh, so we've been dealing with it on a, on a careful, ongoing basis. Sure, I, I, and I have to commend um, your department and yourself, Greg, for how you're dealing with that. I understand that um, if, you know if something is missed and 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 you know they're they're pouring their their foundation on those pilings or whatever, or it's not it doesn't cure properly. Like to lift a house and and to redo it after there's been structural damage could be you know one hundred and fifty thousand, two hundred thousand dollars. So we for sure want to be protecting our residents from that yes. instance, and uh, you know they should ensure as well. I would say make sure that your builder. You know, understands what uh, what the quality that you're expecting as as a homeowner, and uh, that the builders have their contractors are being you know watched and monitored that they're following the the safety code. So thank you for that. Okay, so we have a couple sorry a couple questions that have come in online just recently. So we'll start with the first one. It's a question from Kelly. So Kelly, thanks for joining us uh, tonight on Facebook Live. And I guess, uh, Nadia, the second part of this question I think will be for you. It's kind of in the people pillar. So the question from Kelly is, I'll take the first part. Um, why are prices for temporary housing so high? So I know earlier in your people, um, when you presented on the people pillar, we spoke about Wood Buffalo Housing, the program. So I'll get you to recap that after this. And you know, certainly we're cognizant of that in the community. And the Red Cross is such a great support. And that's why they're, they're here with us every step of the way. They now have two different locations open in Fort McMurray. So we, we, you know, if that's uh, an issue for you and your family, you know, certainly it's something that we're aware of, cognizant of. We want to support you 100%. We uh, suggest you reach out to them. Uh, first thing, but of course, with Buffalo Housing, has a number of uh, programs as well. So we'll ask uh, Nadia, and we could bring back up that slide, perhaps, guys, on the people pillar that was about with Buffalo Housing and, and their programs. And Nadia, if you could just recap that for uh, for Kelly. Yes, certainly. Thank you for your question, Kelly. Um, and just referring back as well to some of the comments that Jeanette has made earlier that. We have been, and the government of Alberta has been working well with the Wood Buffalo Development Corporation to offer a range of options for people. So criteria for eligibility has been changed and altered to make it more accessible for our residents. Just to give you some details, we talked about the social housing program. That, um, that program there is based on 30% of your gross income. So the rent is based on 30% of your gross income. The affordable housing program, the range of prices there is from a bachelor or one bedroom from $1,170 up to $1,300, right up to a four bedroom townhouse. Um, and that's at a cost of $2,100 for a four bedroom townhouse. So certainly you can explore these and other programs that the Wood Buffalo Housing has available by contacting them directly. Um, I also encourage you to, if that's not the route that you choose to go down, our Pulse Line are very, very informed on all of the different options for housing and you can go online and explore some of these options yourself or you can call the Pulse Line and they'll take you through all of the different options that you have when it comes to the Wood Buffalo Housing Programs, how you can get in touch with them if you want to contact property managers or other rentals that will be available throughout the region, if you're trying to get in touch with um, some of our hotel groups that are offering long-term stay rates, and also as well as we keep saying to refer you on to the Red Cross because in a very real way they're providing individual assistance to people that need support with 
rental or housing, whatever your housing options are. So this is, um, what we're trying to do is provide you with your range of options. It's a decision that we certainly know is, is yours to make. It's, you know, however you feel best meets the needs of your family. We are here to provide all of the different options for you and to help you get the support that you need. So I hope you will get in touch with us, Kelly. Thank you for the question. Uh, and thanks again, Kelly. Thank you, Nadia, for that. Our next question is from Tom. Tom, thanks for joining us. Tom is asking, when are the storm drain fillers going to be removed? So I'm going to ask Erin uh, O'Neill, who's our operations manager in the recovery task force, to take that. Erin, go ahead. Thank you, Adam, and thank you, Tom, for that question. There have been um, uh, silt socks throughout town, and our operations and our public works department has been looking at those and ensuring that those can be removed so that they don't have any damage to the roads or to our equipment during the winter maintenance zones. So you will see a lot of that uh, be removed uh, shortly so that the winter, winter maintenance zones will not have an impact and those streets can be clear and free of the snow that we're already receiving. Thank you. And thanks, Tom, once again for the question, and thank you, Aaron. So I guess that wraps up. Do we have any questions uh, from the audience? Bev, it's great to see you, by the way. Bev was a huge hero in Reox. She doesn't want me to, uh, to point her out. She's uh, our, the super-duper, I guess, assistant to our fire chief. Don't worry, you're not on camera. I'm just pointing you out to our fire chief, Darby Allen, who was representing our community at We Day in Toronto today. So shout out to Darby. If you're watching, I'm sure you're not. But... Uh, Bev was a huge star for us in, uh, in REAC, and we couldn't have got through those initial few days in the first couple of weeks without you. So thank you for being here tonight. It's good to see you. Um, so any questions from the audience? Yes, sir. Well, thanks so much for the question, sir. I guess we'll go. I, I need this to survive. Like, I don't Absolutely. Dog, I bought a trailer and stuff to put down there until I got my house replaced. Okay. Well, thanks so much. I guess we'll go. Aaron, you want to take that one? Okay, so we'll go to Aaron O'Neill. Um, thank you for the question. Uh, so we have, we do have weekly meetings with all of our utility providers. We did meet with them yesterday on an update of the uh, services in the areas. Um, the, mer the areas that did experience the most damage, they do have to do complete rebuilds in those areas to um, repair their pipes and re repair their systems in those areas. So there is uh, timelines that are out and they are working diligently to uh, reduce those timelines, but there are some timelines in place that they can't just connect one certain lot um, because they do have to rebuild the majority of those areas um, and at this point um, that you've answered the question I do uh, want to make a plea out to our contractors we have had a number of contractors that have made damage to some of that um, some of the rebuilds that the utility providers have already done um, so if our contractors can be mindful of the utility uh, services that are in place and make sure they're getting locates and make sure they're being careful around those utilities and not damaging them uh, what's happening is when those utilities are damaged, it is taking those rebuild crews away from rebuilding and they're having to go and protect those areas or make those areas safe because it is a life safety issues because those utilities are live. Um, so just a big request to our contractors to be mindful of those utilities. A lot of them are already live and a lot of them have already been rebuilt. So um, just make sure for anybody doing demo or rebuild that they are um, protecting those areas. And sorry, I know you're in contact with Atco Electric, but they are um, diligent working to get that happening as our, our power is history it's gone we need a generator we need power now because I got to move out of Abraham I need that's where my uh, my water everything I can hook up my trailer to I can start it around I'm not moving any more times I want to move home right we need a generator they need to give us some power so that would be a conversation I would have with uh, either your insurance provider or oh, with insurance or with Red Cross or some of our other um, social profit agencies that could help you um, through that process um, so that they could potentially get you hooked up with generators so you are able to uh, 
move out of Abrams Landing and back uh, back to your property within waterways while the utility uh, are rebuilding in those areas. Well, thank you very much, sir, and thank you, Aaron, for the question. Nick, good to see you again in the, in the audience. So if we go back to the audience, is anyone, uh, any other questions from the audience or anything else coming in on Facebook Live? I think we're okay, Jordan, okay, and we're good in, from the audience. So we'll just go into our conclusion now. I'd like to thank everyone uh, for joining us uh, again this evening for our 16th Year For You session. Of course, we also held a session tonight that's still ongoing uh, down the road at the Syncrude Sport and Wellness Center uh, for our Draper residents. So that we, we're, we're glad that that took place. Our next Here For You session will be next Thursday uh, from 4 to 8 p.m. Again, uh, right here at Shell Place will be number 17. We're going to have kind of two featured topics, and normally we've had one. We're going to go with two. We'll talk about the... Uh, oh, we got a question. Just like the, That's what I get for going into the finale. So... It's actually a great question. So the question is, and I'll just read it verbally. I can hear it. Um, what's the person? Who's Denise? I wonder if it's the, okay. Is it, is it, it, it Denise? I can't see the screen, so I hope it's the Denise I know. Uh, Miss Martin, no. Uh, okay, so Denise, good to see you. Or I guess you're seeing me. I can't see you. Uh, the question is, uh, the standing homes and waterways. How close are we? Uh, I guess to that that opening part of phase two reentry. So uh, I guess I'll go to Aaron for that as well. Thanks, Adam, and thanks, Denise, for the question. So we have been working with uh, closely with the Chief Medical Officer of Health and the Alberta government on reentry into the remaining standing areas. Um, it is contingent upon the removal of the ash and debris. We do expect that all that ash and debris will be removed by October 31st. Uh, however, all that said, that does not mean that date might, may not come sooner. If enough ash and debris has been removed from those areas, you may in fact see a re-entry date uh, before October 31st. So we are working diligently to get the remaining uh, people into those standing homes so they can be home as well. But uh, safety is our most important factor. We just want to make sure that the area is safe um, before we have those residents return. So we hope to have an answer for you soon, and we hope and we plan to have all that ash and debris gone by the end of October. Sure, yeah. So uh, we are working, as I mentioned before, with the utility service providers about getting uh, utilities back into waterways. Given the level of destruction within waterways, um, they are required to do a complete rebuild in some of the areas. Um, TELUS is, in fact, installing new services and putting fiber into the system in the majority of areas so they can provide better services throughout the region, so they are doing that. Um, so Utilities is working diligently um, on that, um, but again, I have to caution any time that the contractor does have an impact on um, the existing services, they do need to relocate their teams to fix those areas because they are life safety issues, so that is hampering our ability to, for the rebuild areas. So just, again, another plea out to the contractors to be mindful of those um, utilities that are already restored and make sure they're getting their locates so that um, we're protecting all of those utilities so we can proceed expeditiously with the rebuild. Uh, sorry, Jordan, I answered the question wrong, but uh, standing utilities to standing homes have all been restored, um, so there is uh, service available for all those standing utilities. Uh, you just need to contact your provider so that uh, those can be hooked up. Well, thank you very much for that, Aaron. And uh, Denise, uh, good for you to see me. I, good to see you. I, this is a weird medium, but thanks so much for the question. We'll see you again soon. I hope to see you next week at, uh, at Here For You. So we'll continue the wrap up here. Thank everybody once again for, uh, for joining us tonight. Uh, we'll be back next week, like I said, uh, four to eight here at Shell Place. We'll have uh, two focus next week. Uh, one will be on, I think it's fire smart activities uh, happening specifically in the Birchwood Trails announced this week as we further protect the community under the mitigate pillar. And we'll also talk about small business recovery. Of course, this is small business week in the community. And obviously a huge part of our component economically is to provide as much support as possible, working with all our partners, ensure that our small businesses get back on track as such a backbone of our community. So once again, thank you all our partners for joining us tonight, IBC, YMCA, Northern Alberta, Red Cross, the government of Alberta, of course, our task force staff and our uh, municipal departments, economic development, planning development, and the Fort McMurray Fire Department. Of course, we were joined by our 
uh, Chair Jeanette Bankars, uh, Marty Giles still with us. I know that uh, Kim Jenkins, was uh, one of our board members, was also uh, committee member Sorry was also in the room, and I think him and Councillor Germain have gone down uh, the street to uh, St. Crude Sport and Wellness Centre. So thank you so much for joining us. We'll see you again next week. Here for you continues, and thank you again for staying uh, safe, resilient together as a community. Thank you.